Hey, you guys. Hello, hello, hello. It's David at Bally and Beyond, and we're uh, we're back. I took a day off yesterday. Actually, we we had a, a man in yesterday for an interview. Um, what was his name? Um, and uh, yes, yeah, man in for anyway. Uh, Sanjeev Kumar came yesterday, and, and we did an, a really cool interview, and. Um, so there we go. Um, yes, here I am back again. We're, and we're, the interview, if you want to watch it, it was uh, we, we posted it and, and uh, lots of people liked it. And it actually got a lot of views. He's really cool, uh, very cool man, uh, Indian man and uh, from India originally and, and who's had some pretty amazing awakened experiences. And uh, yeah, I like him. And, and I've interviewed him before, and he's uh, he's got he's got it going on. He really does. And his whole thing around awakening and being you know present is so that we can be more uh, living more in our full potential. And and uh, which is is I guess my thing as well. It's, you know we want to be more in our full potential. Who wants to be more in their full potential? Everybody you know wants to. Be, be functioning as highly as possible while we're here, taking advantage of all the possibilities that, that we can in, in love and life and work and health. And, and uh, so being present really helps with all of that. You know, I mean, that's the deal. And, and uh, um, it's the story in the mind that, uh, that we believe so, you know, blindly that keeps us in mediocrity. You know, living a mediocre life often. You know, and even if if we think, even if our friends tell us it's not true, it, we think our life is a mediocre life. We're caught in the illusion. You know, and and uh, um, if we're really present in each moment, then then there is there's no such thing as as a mediocre life. We're there. We're here. We're now. And so anyway, yesterday's talk was really really good along those uh, that that path. Now today I'm still reading from Eckhart Tolle's Tolle's The Power of Now, and I love this book. I'm loving it more and more as I read it. And uh, we're on page uh, 93. See how the eyes are going to work today. 93. I don't wear glasses. <laughs> Once in a while, <coughs> I have uh, the ones you buy at the drugstore, one uh, twenties. 120s are not much, are they? They're like, well, no, they're just kind of the very beginning. And every once in a while, I wear those if I'm tired. You know, I'm really tired. My eyes don't work as well. But today, they seem to be working. They do. So we're on Chapter 5, The State of Presence. And we're going to buzz through, you know, 8 or 10 pages here and, and uh, follow along if you like. Um, here we go. It's not what you think it is. The state of presence, it's not what you think it is, he says. The question is, at page 93, the question is, uh, you keep talking about the state of presence as the key. I think I understand it intellectually, but I don't know if I've ever truly experienced it. I wonder, is it what I think it is, or is it something entirely different? So that's his question from one of his students. And, and uh, a lot of his writing in this book is, is a reflection on questions. Um, so he says, it's not what you think it is. You can't think about presence, and the mind can't understand it. Understanding presence is like being present. <laughs> uh, JR is here with me, and she's, she's helping to repost some of these on some of our groups. How's it going? All right. And, and, uh, and when she opened one up, you could hear, and there's a lag, eh? Yeah, how much is the lag? Is it like seconds? Yeah, cool. <clears throat> so when I'm saying it here, it doesn't show on the, uh, on, in for you for a little bit, there's a bit of a lag. He said, it's not what you think it is. You can't think about presence, and the mind can't understand it. <coughs> <coughs> Understanding presence is uh, 
Understanding presence is being present. <laughs> Understanding presence is being present. <laughs> Try a little experiment. Close your eyes and say to yourself, I wonder what my next thought is going to be. Then become very alert and wait for the next thought. <laughs> be like a cat watching a mouse hole. What thought is going to come out of the mouse hole? Try it now. Okay, let's do that. student says, I had to wait for quite a long time before a thought came in. Exactly. As long as you're in a state of intense presence, you are free of thought. You are still, yet highly alert. The instant your conscious attention sinks beyond below a certain level, a thought rushes in. The mental noise returns and stillness is lost. You are back in time. Whoa. To test your degree of presence, some Zen masters have been known to creep up on their students from behind and suddenly hit them with a stick. Quite a shock. If the student has been fully present in a state of alertness, if he had kept his loin, uh, his loin girded and his uh, lamp burning, which is one of the analogies that Jesus uses for presence, he would have noticed the master coming up from behind and stopped him or stepped aside. But if he were hit, that would mean he was immersed in thought, which is to say absent or unconscious. Wow. So we're present, we're more conscious of what's going on. Does that make sense? And if we're more conscious, our teacher can't hit us with a stick. And who's our teacher? Life. The universe. The universal teacher. Hmm. To stay present in everyday life, it helps to be deeply rooted within oneself. Otherwise, the mind, which is incredible momentum, will drag you along like a wild river. What do you mean, uh, rooted within yourself? It means to inhabit your body fully, to always have some of your attention in the inner energy field of your body, to feel the body from within, so to speak. Body awareness keeps you present. It anchors you in the now. It anchors you in the now. <laughs> the esoteric meaning of waiting, the subtitle. In a sense, the state of presence could be compared to waiting. Jesus used the analogy of waiting in some of his parables. Uh, this is not the usual bored or restless kind of waiting, but is a denial of the present. Oh, this is not a, a usual bored or restless kind of waiting that is a denial of the present and that I spoke about earlier. It is not a waiting in which your attention is focused on some point in the future and, and the present is perceived as a undesirable object, obstacle that prevents you from being prevents you from having what you want. This is a quanti qualitative, different, qualitatively different kind of waiting, one that requires your total alertness. Something could happen in, at any moment, and if you're not absolutely awake, absolutely still, you will miss it. This is the kind of waiting uh, Jesus talked about. In that state, all your attention is in the now. All your attention is in the now. There is, um, there is, there is none left for daydreaming, thinking, remembering, anticipating. There is no tension in it, no fear, just alert presence. Uh, you are present with your whole being, with every cell of your body. In that state, the you that has a past and a future. The personality, if you like, is hardly there anymore, and yet nothing of value is lost. You are still essentially yourself. In fact, you are more fully yourself than you ever were before, or rather, it is the only now that you are truly, it is, it is only in the now. It is only now 
but you're truly yourself. <laughs> Fun. Uh, it, it takes me a while. Here we go. Uh, be like a servant waiting for the return of the master, says Jesus. The servant does not know at what hour the master is coming, going to come. So he stays awake, alert, poised, still, lest he miss the master's arrival. In another parable, Jesus spake of the five careless, unconscious women who uh, do not have enough oil consciousness to keep their lamps burning, staying present. Uh, so miss the bridegroom, the now, and don't uh, get to the wedding feast, enlightenment. Wow. These five stand in contrast to the five wise women who have enough oil and stay conscious. Even the, man, the men who wrote the Gospels did not understand the meaning of these parables. So the first misinterpretation and distortion crept in as they were, write, as they were written down. Uh, with subsequent erroneous interpretations, the real meaning was completely lost. These are parables. Uh, not about the end of the world, but uh, about the end of psychological time. They point to the transcendence of the e egoic mind and the possibility of living in an extreme new state of consciousness. Hmm. Beauty arises in the stillness of your presence. The subtitle. The student's question is, what you have just described is something that I occasionally experience with brief moments, for brief moments, when I'm alone and surrounded by nature. Eckhart Tolle says, yes, Zen masters are the word, use the word Satori to describe a flash of insight, a moment of no mind and total presence. Although Satori is not a lasting transformation, be grateful when it comes, for it gives you a taste of enlightenment. You may indeed have experienced it many times without knowing uh, what it is and realizing its importance. Presence, presence is needed uh, to become aware of the beauty, uh, the majesty, the sacredness of nature. Have you ever gazed up into the infinity of space on a clear night, awestruck by the absolute stillness and inconceivable vastness of it? Have you listened, truly listened, uh, to the um, sound of a mountain stream in the forest or to the song of a blackbird at dusk on a quiet summer evening? To become aware of such things, the mind needs to be still. You have to put down for a moment your personal baggage of problems uh, past and future as well as all your knowledge. Otherwise, you will see but not see, hear but not hear. Your total presence is required. Wow. Beyond the beauty of the external form, beyond the beauty of the external form, there's more here. Uh, something that cannot be named. Something ineffable. Uh, some deep, inner holy essence uh, whenever and wherever uh, there is beauty this inner essence shines through somehow it uh, only reveals itself to you when you are present could it be that the nameless essence you and your presence are one and the same oh my gosh would it would it be there without your presence go deeply into it find out for yourself hmm. when you experience these moments of presence uh, or satori he called them the satoris are, are cool uh, you likely didn't realize that you were briefly in a sense of no mind in a state of no mind this is because the gap between the state and the influx of thought was too narrow your satori may only have lasted for a few seconds before the mind came in, but it was there. Otherwise, you would not have experienced the beauty. 
mind can neither recognize nor create beauty. Uh, only for a few seconds, only for a few seconds while you were completely present, was that beauty, was that beauty or that sacredness there. Because of the narrowness of the gap and the lack of vigilance and alertness on your part, you were probably unable to see the fundamental difference uh, between the perception, um, between the perception, the thoughtless awareness of beauty between the perception the thoughtless awareness of beauty and the naming and interpreting of it as thought oh I see uh, this time gap was so small that it seemed to be this uh, be a single process the truth is however that the moment thought came in all you had was a memory of it hmm the wider the time gap between perception and thought the more deep a depth there is uh, to you as a human being, which is to say the more conscious you are. Uh, many people are so imprisoned in their minds uh, that the beauty of nature does not uh, really exist for them. Um, they might say, what a pretty flower, but that's just a mechanical um, mental labeling because they are not still, they are not present, they don't truly see the flower, uh, don't feel its essence, its holiness, uh, just as they don't know themselves, and don't feel their own essence and their own holiness. Because we live in such a mind-dominated culture, most modern art, architectural, architecture, music, and literature are devoid uh, of the beauty of inner essence. And uh, very few, with very few exceptions, uh, the person. Um, the, the reason is that the person who creates those things cannot, even for a moment, free themselves from their mind. So they are never in touch with that place within, where where true creation, creativity, and beauty arise. Awesome. The mind left to itself creates. Monster, mon monstrosities, and, and uh, not only in art galleries, and not only in art galleries. Look at the urban landscape and the industrial wastelands. No civilization has ever produced so much ugliness. Hmm. Hi, Kim. You're welcome. You're back. Hi, love. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> You're in the UK, aren't you? Yes, you are. So I'm on page 98. Did you get a copy of the book? I'm on page 98, um, reading in chapter 5. Um, I'm enjoying it. It's a, 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 bit of a, 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 a bit of a tough read today. I'm having a... Uh, <laughs> you, did you get a copy of the book, Kim? Um, to, it's nice if you follow along. I um, you know, find myself popping out a bit. Uh, a lot going on here today, and it's and the mind is so. Um, you can't find one. My gosh, we'll order one from. I, I think there's a link. Um, or if you go to my website, there's a page of books, and you can Amazon will send it right to your door, love. Boom, just like that. And uh, Eckhart Tolle, have you ever heard of him before? Anyway, he's amazing. He really is. He was in Calgary. Um, like six months ago, I think. I think it was about six months ago. I went to see him. It was great, you know. Um, it's interesting. Um, the how many people are loving this um, at this time? Hi, Jr. I see you back. Awesome. Uh, okay, we're on page uh, ninety-eight and uh, realizing pure consciousness. Well, this is the game, isn't it? Um, my phone just rang. It was interesting. Uh, <laughs> I'm glad you like it. Thanks, Kim. I appreciate you saying that. Um, is presence the same as being? Is presence the same as being? It's a student's question. When you become conscious of being, that is what is really happening is that being becomes conscious of itself. When being becomes conscious of itself, that's presence. Cool. Uh, since being conscious, 
being. Since being, uh, consciousness, and life are synonymous, you could say that presence means consciousness becoming conscious of itself, or life attaining self-consciousness. But uh, don't get attached to the words, and, and don't make an effort to understand this. There's nothing that you need to understand before you become present. Pretty cool. Next question. I do understand what you just said, but it seems to imply that being, the ultimate, the ultimate uh, transcendental reality, is not yet complete, that it is undergoing a process of a development. Does God need time for personal growth? Hmm. Yes, he says. Oh, my gosh. But only as seen from the limited perception, uh, perceptive, the limited perceptive, of perspective, perspective. Sorry, of the manifest universe, of the un, yeah, the manifested universe. In the Bible, God declares, "I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the Living One." In the timeless realm where God dwells, there is also your, which is also your home, the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega are one. Uh, the essence of everything that ever has been and ever will be is uh, eternally present in the unmanifested state of oneness and perfection, totally beyond anything the human mind can even imagine or comprehend. In our world of seemingly separate forms, however, timeless perfection is the, unconceiv the inconceivable concept. Here, even consciousness, which is the light emanating from the eternal, here, even consciousness, which is the light emanating from the eternal, um, from the eternal source, seems to be subject to a process of development. But this is due to our limited perception. It is not so in absolute terms. Nevertheless, let me continue to speak for a moment about the evolution of consciousness in this world. Everything that exists has being, has God essence, has some degree of consciousness. Even a stone has rudimentary, rudimentary consciousness. Otherwise, it would not be, and its atoms and molecules would disperse. Everything is alive. The sun, the earth, the planets, the animals, the humans, all are expressions of consciousness in very varying degrees. Consciousness manifesting as form. Uh, the world arises the world arises when consciousness takes on shapes and forms, thought forms and material forms. Uh, look at the millions of life forms on this planet alone, in the uh, sea, on land and in the air. And then each life form is uh, replicated millions of times. To that end, it's uh, to that to what end uh, is someone or something playing a game or a game with form? This is what the ancient seers. This is what the ancient seers of India asked themselves. They saw the world as lila, lila, l i l a, a kind of divine game that God is playing. The individual life forms are obviously not very important in this game. In this, in the sea, most life forms don't survive more than a few minutes after being born. The human uh, forms turn turns to dust uh, pretty quickly too. When it is gone, it is as if it had never been. Um, is this tragic or cruel? Only if you create a separate identity for each form. Only if you create a separate identity for each form. If you forget that its consciousness its consciousness is God essence expressing itself in form. Oh, so it's only a tragedy if we forget that. My gosh. Um, if you forget that its consciousness, uh, its consciousness is God's essence expressing itself in form. But if you don't truly know that until you realize, but you don't truly know that until you realize your own God essence as pure consciousness. Oh my gosh, I get it. Yeah. <clears throat> if a fish is born in your aquarium, 
and you call him John, and write out a birth certificate, tell him about his family history, and uh, two minutes later he gets eaten by another fish, that's tragic. But it's only tragic because you projected a separate self where there is none. You got hold of a fraction of a dynamic process, a molecule dance, and made a separate entity out of it. Isn't that funny? We do that with pets, don't we? Children. <laughs> Romance. You know? Um, consciousness takes on the disguise of forms until they reach such complexity that it completely loses itself in them. That it completely loses itself in them. In present day humans, consciousness is completely identified with its disguise. Hmm. The crux of the problem. I think we've reached the. Eh? Identified with its disguise. <laughs> it only knows itself as form and therefore lives in fear of the alienation of its physical or psychological form. This is the egoic mind. And, and this is where. Thank you. This is. <laughs> thank you. Hi, Kim. This is the egoic mind. And this is where considerable dysfunction sets in. It now looks as if something had gone very wrong somewhere along the line of evolution. This is where considerable dysfunction sets in. It now looks as if something had gone very wrong somewhere along the line of evolution. But even this is part of Leela, the divine game. Finally, the presence of suffering, uh, the, the presence of suffering created by this apparent dysfunction forces consciousness to disidentify with form and awaken, and awakens it from its dream of form. It regains self-consciousness, but it is at a far deeper level than when it lost it. Hmm. I've been kind of in that process myself lately. <laughs> This process is explained by Jesus in his parable of the lost son, who leaves his father's home, squanders his wealth, becomes destitute, and is then forced by his suffering to return home. When he does, his father loves him more than before. The son's state is the same as it was before, yet now, but yet not the same. Uh, it had an added dimension of depth. The parable describes a journey from unconscious perfection through apparent imperfection and evil to conscious perfe perfection. Nice. Um, isn't that funny? Because I so often thought that that story was really about the brother <laughs> who was like, oh, yeah, I, he got jealous, remember? Um, We can now see the deeper and wider significance of becoming present as the watcher of your mind. Uh, whenever you watch the mind, you withdraw consciousness from mind forms and then become what we call the watcher or the witness. Cons consequently, the watcher, pure, uh, pure consciousness beyond form, becomes stronger and the mental formations become weaker. Uh, when uh, we talk about watching the uh, mind, we are uh, personally, we're, we are personalizing an event that is truly of cosmic significance. Uh, though you, through you, consciousness is awakening out of its dream of identification with form and withdrawing from form. Uh, this foreshadows, but is already part of, an event that is probably still in the distant future as far as the chronological time is concerned, the event is called the end of the world. Wow. Okay, keep going here. When consciousness frees itself from its identification with physical and mental forms, it begins what we may call pure or enlightened, it, it becomes what we may call pure or enlightened consciousness or presence. Uh, this has already happened in a few individuals, and it seems destined to happen soon on a much larger scale, although there is no absolute uh, guarantee that it will happen. 
most humans are still in the gap of the ego, the grip of the ego, uh, egoic mode of consciousness, identified with their mind and run by their mind. If they do not free themselves from their mind in time, they will be destroyed by it. They will experience increasing confusion, conflict, violence, illness, and despair and madness. Egoic mind has become uh, become like a sinking ship. If you don't get off, you will go down with it. The collective egoic mind is the most dangerously insane and uh, destructively destructive entity ever to be have ever to habitate this planet. <laughs> <coughs> uh, what do <coughs> you think will happen on this planet if human consciousness remains unchanged? Hmm. I think we're seeing. You know, and, and, and even that needs not to be taken too seriously because we can get attached to the, you know, the ego through um, complaint about what's happening on the planet. And, and, uh, you know, so even that's a bit of a trap. So if we surrender, uh, each and every one of us, um, the the planet will clean up itself. And you know, our habits will change, things will change. So it's pretty exciting. Um, already, for some humans, the only respite uh, they find from their own mind is to occasionally revert to the level of consciousness below thought. Everyone does that every night during sleep. But this also happens to some extent, to some extent, through uh, sex, alcohol, uh, and other drugs that uh, suppress e excessive uh, mind activity. If it weren't for alcohol, tranquilizers, antidepressants, as well as the illegal drugs, which are all consumed in vast quantities, the insanity of the human mind would become even more glaringly obvious than it is already. I believe that. Uh, if deprived of our drugs, a large part of the population uh, will become a danger to themselves and others. Um, these drugs, of course, simply keep you stuck in dysfunction. And their widespread use only delays the breakdown of the old mind structures and the emergence of a higher consciousness. While individual users may get some relief from the daily torture inflicted on them by their minds, they are prevented from uh, generating enough conscious presence uh, to rise above thought and to find true transformation. Wow. Falling back to the level of consciousness below mind, which is the pure thinking level of our distinct ancestors and of animals and plants, is not an option for us. There's no way back, oh I see, if the human race is to survive. We'll have to go on uh, to the next stage. Consciousness is evolving throughout the universe in billions of forms. So even if we didn't make it, uh, this wouldn't matter on a cosmic scale. No gain in consciousness is ever lost. So it would simply express itself through some other form. But the very fact that I'm speaking here and you're listening or reading this is a clear sign that the new consciousness is gaining a foothold on the planet. There's nothing personal in this. I'm not teaching you. Uh, you are consciousness and you are listening to yourself. There is an Eastern saying, the teacher and the taught together create the teaching. The teacher and the taught create together create the teaching. In any case, the words in themselves are not important. They are not the truth. They only point to it. I speak from, I, I speak from presence, and so I speak. Uh, you may be able to join me in that state, although every word that I use has a history, of course, and comes from the past, uh, as all languages does. Um, the words that I speak, as uh, I speak to you now are carriers of the high energy frequency of presence and, and, and quite apart from the meaning they convey as words. Oh, isn't that interesting? So I, I love what he's saying. And the truth is that, uh, um, that, that, that 
the presence is in the words. It's, it's not just the words, but it's in the, you know, it's in the book. It, it's. Um, I remember spending time with my teacher years ago, and and it wasn't what he said. And he used to say that it isn't what I'm saying. Um, just to listen, um, you know, to the presence in the words. It was great, and I feel it here. Silence is an even more potent carrier of presence. So when you read this or listen to me speak, be aware of the silence between and underneath the words. Be aware of the gaps. To listen to the silence, wherever you are, is an easy and direct way of becoming present. Even if there is noise, there is always some silence underneath and in between the sounds. Listening to the silence immediately uh, creates stillness inside you. Only the, only the stillness in you can perceive the silence outside. And what is stillness other than presence, uh, consciousness, freed from thought forms? Here is, the living, here is the living realization of what we have been talking about. Wow. I think that's as far as I'm going to go today. Um, we're uh, well into chapter 5, which I started on page 93. And we're now on page 104. That's enough. That's enough. I think 10 pages kind of does it for me today. Love you guys. Kim, thank you so much. I'm really uh, feeling your presence. And and, uh, um, and I love that you have a Harley. <laughs> I got my plates on mine yesterday. and uh, So I'll have it out. I'll send you uh, a picture when I get it going. I'll, I'll have it out in the next day or two. You know, spring has sprung. The grass is riz. It's time to get my Harley going. It, it is. Okay. So love you guys. Thanks so much. You can follow us on uh, um, also on YouTube. And uh, uh, I love it if you share these posts. From t You know, that, that's cool if you get a chance to share them if you'd like to. And, and uh, um, also uh, check out our website, valleyandbeyond.ca. And, uh, you know, maybe look at uh, one of my meditation kits and see what you think of that. And, um, and, and my name is David McElwain. You can always uh, connect with me personally on Facebook and uh, or Instagram. Yes. Thank you, uh, uh, Kim. Love you lots. Love you all. And uh, we'll uh, hopefully we'll do this again tomorrow. Cheers. Bye.